Welcome back to the morning show here on Arise News. Joining us now to speak on the headlines news this past week from President Buhari's address at the United Nations General Assembly to Article 66 point appeal against President Buhari is public affairs analyst and lecturer of political science at Veritas University, Mr. Adiabu Onoja. Welcome and good morning. Good morning. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Good morning. Um, I wanted us to start with the president's address. Um, last week was the United Nations General Assembly. There was a lot buzzing from um, New York. There was a lot of reporting from New York. Um, I wanted to start with the president's address and get your sense and your, your, what did you think of his address? And then we can get into some of the specifics of the address. But in general, what tone did you think he struck with world leaders? All right, let's actually take a look at the speech first, and then we'll go. Current attempts to help develop Africa by industrial countries are uncoordinated and plainly incremental. We have the skills, the manpower, and the natural resources, but in many instances, we lack the capital. Hence my plea for industrial countries to take a long-term view of Africa we request you to come and partner with us to develop the continent for the benefit of all. Africa charges you with the singular task of initiating the effort we are calling for. The United Nations has in place processes for promoting collective action to combat global threats. No threat is more potent than poverty and exclusion. They are the foul source from which common criminality, insurgency, cross-border crimes, human trafficking, and its terrible consequences draw their inspiration. Poverty in all its manifestations remain one of the greatest challenges facing our world. Its eradication is an indispensable requirement for achieving sustainable development. In this regard, Nigeria has developed a national social investment program, a pro-poor scheme that targets the poorest and most vulnerable households in the country. Under this initiative, easy access to financial services are facilitated to traders, artisans, market women, and cooperative societies. This type of initiative can help lessen and eventually eliminate mass poverty in Africa. At the core of our efforts to build an inclusive society, our programs are focused on youth and women empowerment. These programs aim at ensuring women and youth participation in governance, industry, climate action, and agriculture. Thank you. As you heard there, you heard the president talk about poverty, which was one of the themes of this year's. Um, he talked about education and climate action, which were all themes for 74 UNGA. Just in general, I want to get your sense, and then I want us to go into some of the specifics that he brought up, especially around poverty. Um. <clears throat> I would be at a loss to capture my sense of what the president was saying, especially doing so without being rude to the government, uh, to the people in government. I think he was saying something great, but uh, I think he was addressing the right audience, but with a wrong message. That's, that's the farthest I can go. Wow, okay. Let's then start with what do you think would have been the right message for this audience? Well, he, he, he has a message. He was talking about uh, multilateral engagement with Africa is uncoordinated. That might be correct. There is nothing to quarrel about that. But he's asking them to come and partner with Africa. But on whose terms? If you recall very well, that's exactly what the modernization theorists were parading in the 50s and early 60s. And the world rose in opposition to that because it's like you are projecting that there is a sense in which we can conceptualize development as an end point at a, at a, at a space. 
and Africa is at a starting point, at a pre-takeoff page at that point and at that, uh, at, at that spectrum. Now, that's what we protested as student union activists and as radicals throughout Nigeria in the 60s and up to 84, up to 85, before structural adjustment came and reinforced it. Which means if the president is articulating this at this point, he's taking us far, far, too far back. So I don't know who put together the address, and that's why I said great message, but uh, great, good audience, but wrong message. Because these are also, the United Nations system has the, the big power that uh, animates the system. And you are, that's the audience is talking to. He should have put in place uh, a document, an argument, a case, a model, and uh, said, this is the model we want you to buy into. Not to say, come and partner with us in a way that it will be, the partnership will be on their own terms. That's what they're already doing. What so in other of, words, we haven't put any new case before them. So Mr. Anaja, what kind of model should he have proposed? Well, if you, I mean, the argument is not a, it's not a new argument. Africa is pre-industrial, right? Mm -hmm. Even South Africa is still pre-industrial. And you cannot get the benefits of modernity without being an industrial economy. So the first uh, assignment is how to industrialize. The debates about industrialization have taken several forms, but the most important is the primacy of the state. The nation state must lead the process, must be the key actor. All others are supporters. And that's, that's the tragedy of Nigeria. That's how Nigeria started. Even the so-called conservatives bought that argument. The tragedy is that today it is not part of the debate in Nigeria. What we are talking about is true federalism, ethnic federalism, separation, and all of that. The question of integrated national economy is no longer on the debate in Nigeria. Now, the president has removed it completely and brought back modernization theory. That's the tragedy of that address. Even though the delivery was much better, and it sounded, uh, it sounded uh, nice and diplomatically OK. But the substance is tragic. Hmm. All right. I just wanted to go into some of, I mean, <laughs> it's very difficult to go on from where you've left off on the tragedy. But I wanted to just sort of also go into some of the specifics about what opportunities do you thought that Mr. President took advantage of and where you um, feel that there were still areas that we didn't take enough of an advantage. You've already said overall we didn't, we didn't, we sort of didn't strike the right tone. My question to you was on the issue of poverty um, and putting a plan forward. One of the things that the president has said and has continued to say is lifting 100 million people out of poverty during his administration, and we haven't um, seen a plan on how to do that. Do you think that this, was, this would have been a great opportunity for the president to present a plan to the world on how he, could, how he is going to actually lift 100 million people out of poverty and get cooperation and also call to action on that plan? Yeah, I, I think he lost that opportunity. He has lost that opportunity. Um, if he had gone there to say, this is the primary assignment we have identified for ourselves in Nigeria, He's saying that, instead of saying that, and that can only uh, mean that he articulated a, a model, he did not. Instead of saying that, he's saying they have uh, taken so so number of people out of poverty. I'm not interested in contesting the empirics. What I'm interested in is, it's not how many people you took out of poverty. How did you do it? If you don't articulate, if you did not explain how you did it, then you are like, you're just like saying, you are a magician. And I don't think he has ever said he's a magician. So we are, not in, we are not contesting the figures. It may be possible. It may not have been, it may not have happened. The point is, how did you do it? If you articulate how you did it, then we can look at the deficiencies, the merits, and the potentials. Otherwise, we are left stranded. You didn't tell us how you did it. But the president and if you have been did... on the ground in Nigeria, 
He did make mention of his national social investment program and school feeding programs mm -hmm. in the area of poverty eradication and education. What are your thoughts on these two programs that he mentioned? We want grand strategies, not, not, uh, not sectoral or uh, those kind of uh, uh, knee-jerk responses that, that even the World Bank itself has dismissed. The World Bank says your social spending is too, uh, is too low. It cannot raise the country, it cannot sustain the kind of uh, uh, leap, from, uh, leap forward that you need to achieve to uh, reach a level that we can measure as having done anything. I mean, you have to, I mean, if you, if you raised uh, the, the number that he's talking about in Nigeria, it, doesn't, it still doesn't make sense in itself. You have to compare it. Within the African uh, average, what does that amount to? That is when you start celebrating. I'm not saying they didn't do anything. What I'm saying is that the crisis we are facing is not the type where you go to the United Nations and say, we have raised, I mean, you are talking of about 200 million. So if you raise 100 million, it means the, and since, uh, since a, a substantial number of people are already wealthy, then there shouldn't be a poverty problem in Nigeria again by now, if that were correct. I, I, I just want us to make a point of correction. The president said that they will raise 100 million people out of in the next poverty in the years. next 10 years. Not that they have. I think that what we're saying yes, is we have is... not seen that plan. Yeah, but that still goes back to the point I'm making. What is the model by which you are going to do that? I mean, the Chinese can tell you we have plans to raise so, 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 because they have a clear strategy of how to approach development, all right? State intervention, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, you might, you may be, have been aware of, you know, a kind of recent tilt towards the Chinese model. The British think tank is saying this Chinese model is something to look into again. That's Shetham House. That's a serious statement because, I mean, they are much more frank about uh, the contradictions and the dialectics of development politics. Now, if they are saying that, it means okay. there is something. We're going to go on a break. Sir, we're going to go on a break. When we come back, um, we're going to pick up where we left off and then talk a little bit about the climate parts of the speech, and then also go on to other headlines. Stay with us. Welcome back. Um, we're still with Mr. Ade, Adegbo Onoja, um, Veritas lecturer, the university lecturer, talking about the headlines of the week. Sir, before we went on break, you were talking about the advice from Chatham House of Nigeria to relook at, a ch at the China model. I just wanted to give you some time to elaborate on that before we go on to our next question. No, they were not asking Nigeria. It's the, it's the World Bank that's asking Nigeria to look at its social spending. Chatham House wrote an article which is just for everybody. It's, it, was, it was just, uh, a, it was just uh, wondering the, about the magic of the uh, China model. And uh, I, I mean, for that to come out, significant. I mean, any other person, radical, activist, uh, campaigners, can say that, can make that sort of statement. But if, when Shadam House makes it, it be, acquires a, a different significance. That's what I, I was just saying. It's the World Bank that has been telling Nigeria to up its social spending. Uh, that, that's also important because it's the World Bank that has been saying, don't spend on schools, don't spend on social services, spend on, on uh, primary school, spend on uh, privatized, and so on and so forth. Now they have changed the music. Is Nigeria responding to that music? That's the question. Well, what, what are your thoughts? Since you mentioned the World Bank, Nigeria has approached the World Bank for a $2.5 billion loan. And this is creating some resistance in certain quarters. There's actually a petition that's been filed to try and stop Nigeria obtaining this loan. There's protests being planned in Washington, D.C. by concerned Nigerians in the diaspora. I want to know your thoughts on that. And also, this week, the Minister for Finance, Budget, and National Planning, Zainab Ahmed, 
revealed that Nigeria has a huge infrastructure deficit. We all knew that. But she said it's to the tune of $100 billion for the next 30 years, a $3 trillion deficit. How on earth are we going to fund this? What are your thoughts on all of that? I still go back to, you know, I mean, we just have to wonder, how, how would you not have infrastructure deficit if you are not an industrial economy, if you don't produce anything, if you don't add value to the raw materials you have? and you have to import, you, you, naturally, you will naturally experience uh, infrastructure deficit. So those, those kind of statements that the ministers make, I don't know who gives it to them and who tells them that those are the sort of statements that they should be making. They are natural consequences of where you are in terms of value added. Why did, did, did don't they read what happened in Nigeria economic planning in the 60s? And even before then, the big debates that took place, even within the civil service, which was a very qualitative civil service, right? So if you look at those debates up to the up to 70s, up to mid-70s, then you will not make that sort of statement. Because everything there are clearly specified. These are the consequences of the trajectory you follow. So, so she ought not to be saying those things. What she ought to be saying is, these are our responses, these are our plans to respond to these challenges. Then those plans are the issues for debate. Okay. Um, I want us to um, shift a little bit. Um, one of the things that the president did do in his speech was bring up the current and ongoing issue around um, the PNID ruling, and I just want to read that part of the speech, where it says, this is true in the battle against violent extremism, against trafficking, he goes, and then he says, the present Nigerian government is facing the challenges of corruption head-on. We're giving notice to international criminal groups by vigorous prosecution of the PNID scam, attempting to cheat Nigeria of billions of dollars. I want to get your opinion on bringing this to the global stage and also the new and sort of new efforts that Nigeria is taking to fight this 9.6 billion ruling that um, from the arbitration court. I just wanted to get your sense and how do you think that the world would receive this at that on that stage? Well, I, I, it depends on the type of the world you are talking about. Those who rule the world have no. Uh, this cannot be anything new to them. They know what they are doing in all parts of the world. And they know why it is possible for them <coughs> to do that in Nigeria. Because in Nigeria, they don't have to be here. They have local elements who are doing it even better than, than them. So, so I don't think it will shock those who ought to know, those who know. Those who don't know, those like us who are not part of the, this thing, uh, yeah, that's, that's a great statement, but what one would have done, I mean, that's exactly the expectation about uh, the Buhari personality coming, coming back as president of Nigeria, that he will provide detailed, um, detailed cases of this sort of uh, things where uh, the ruling class, a nation's ruling class, decides to rape the nation continuously, on a continuous basis, the extent they went. And if he did that, then he would mobilize and be able to deal with that and put a stop to it. Fortunately or unfortunately, the process of dealing with that has got its own complications. And right now, the president stands defeated at the level of public debate in terms of the character and direction of the anti-corruption uh, war. That's one contradiction there. I'm not saying he's right or wrong. I'm, I'm observing a contradiction, a major contradiction. Once you lose the war at the level of discourse, you have lost everything. So can the president regroup, re, uh, recover and sustain a war against corruption that will be credible and adjudged acceptable even by his opponents? That's the issue. That's one issue there. Uh, Can he? The larger issue is the is the point. 
I would like to well, get your opinion. I, I don't know. Uh, well, they, I mean, it's they, they, I mean, he has just about three more years to go. Three years is long in politics, but has he laid the, the groundwork that will uh, enable him to triumph? Has he presented the case in a way that even his opponents will see the point? Actually, the assumption was that the president was brought in by the kingmakers to do exactly that. But now he's at war with most of the kingmakers. So can he, can he recover? Can he represent the case in a way that even uh, his critics would see the point? I think somebody mentioned uh, Amcon, five trillion, uh, then PID, and it's all over. Can we have a holistic representation of this in a way that will shake the, the conscience of the average Nigerian, wherever he or she may be? I think they are not getting the battle at the level of discourse. The representational war, the president and the government don't appear to have won that war. If you haven't won that war, you have lost the rest. Well, that's a really interesting point that you raised there. But I want to move on a little bit and look at the latest developments with regards to the Shoare case. The convener of Hashtag Revolution Now was granted bail by a federal high court in Abuja, but has yet to be released. Now, his um, legal team has filed contempt charges against DSS because DSS is acting in contempt of a court order. Court orders are not suggestions. They are orders, as the name mm -hmm. you know, implies. What are your thoughts on the rule of law in Nigeria mm -hmm. at this point and what this filing could portend? I don't know which one to take first. Um, well, I, I would say this filing is just part of the leg legal uh, gymnastics that will go on for quite some time, as long as uh, Shawode is held in detention. That's to be expected, uh, because there must be contestation of uh, all cases of detention, because we wish that we are all free to make our point, to agitate, to make our case, although we may not call it a revolution and so on. So I don't think that's anything uh, strange. I think the bigger question is rule of law. Uh, if you are satisfied with that answer, then we can go on. Oh, I'm perfectly satisfied with your answer. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Do we have rule of law in Nigeria or in much of Africa? No, we don't have. It's not, it's not particular about any regime, but the structure of power, the, 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 the aggregate consciousness are all antithetical to the notion of rule of law. In Nigeria at the moment now, the judiciary, everybody can see that the judiciary is very weak. And I think I saw one of the uh, new senior advocates calling for overhaul of the judiciary. Uh, the legislature is also uh, not seen as uh, very purposive and up and doing. Now, this might be just perception, but perceptions are what determines every other thing. If those perceptions are there, then there is something to worry about. The whole logic of the presidential system of government is the oversight capacity of the legislature and the judiciary. And I would have thought that someone like uh, General Buhari, who is very conscious of his uh, image, would ensure that the rule of law is very primary in the conduct of government. The reason is because if you have nobody checking you, you may overstep your bounds even in spite of yourself. So it's a safety valve that anybody who is conscious of the frailty of the human mind would just simply allow or allow or make, make rooms for it to flourish, for rule of law to flourish. Secondly, we want to produce judges that we can export, that have struck at the code of excellence, as for other countries to say, this is admirable. That's the, that's the intangible part of nation building that we have not done well. You can ask a judge, you can influence a judge monetarily or otherwise to give judgment this way or that way, but you are killing something that you yourself may become a victim of. 
for so many years, he was going to court, the president. So I thought that after that experience, he will be a pillar in the, in the struggle for rule of law. And it should be done in a way that is so transparent that you can give him credit for that. As a military man who, st who has discovered that rule of law is good, um, I don't know if that uh, is what Nigerians perceive. The perception now is that the judiciary is very weak. So when he says at the United Nations, I mean... All right. We're, um, there, sir, we're going to ask you to hold that thought. We're going to come right back to you after this short break. Thank you. Well, welcome back to The Morning Show. We're still with lecturer of political science at Veritas University, Mr. Adiagbo, Adiagbo Onodja, talking about the headlines of the week. So, sir, just on the issue of rule of law, I hate to go back to the speech, but I just wanted to point out one thing that the president did say in his speech, which is, in Nigeria, we have made significant strides to put our own house in order. We will work tirelessly to uphold due process. The rule of law remains the permanent, unchanging foundation of the world order. So it obviously appears that um, this, we, we aspire, there's a lot of aspiration when it comes to rule of law and also to um, court orders, as we've just discussed. But just um, going away from that, um, if you look at, once again, sort of the way the president has positioned his passion for Africa, did you want to comment on that, sir? Okay. What? Um, did it <laughs> the way he has done what? Okay, no problem. Let me continue. Um, the way he has um, continued to, in his, in his speech, he was quite passionate about Africa. I want to talk to you about the Benin and um, Niger border closure and the persistence of that with really no plan or no communication of when these borders might reopen. I wanted to get your sense of that, especially if we're having global conversations about cooperation across Africa, but even inside Africa, people aren't seeing us walk that walk. What do you, what, what is, what do you think, and what should we be, what should we be looking at when it comes to these border, this border closure, and the fact that there is no ending to it, and how we interact with our neighbors, especially since we are signatories to and members of ECOWAS. Well, I'm not sure I've got uh, sufficient information on that to be able to make any authoritative comment as to whether I reject it or whether I accept it. I read, uh, I think, the CG of customs. He said that some uh, weapons have been found in some of the trucks that are at Seme border and things like that. Uh, generally, all discourses of border are binary in nature. We versus they. You know, we the good guys, they the bad guys. So. Um, you can never prove whether it's correct or proper for them to close the border. But this is a very specific security issue, I think. Uh, I don't know the information they have, but they are saying, because I read that address where he was telling custom officers that the guns that are being brought to the country are coming in through the borders, and that the guns, their wives, their brothers, their relations could be victims of the guns. So I suspect he's making... Uh, information, uh, a, a, a judgment based on what he probably has. I don't know. It could be part of the politics of uh, border control, but I suspect they have specific uh, uh, information that they are uh, operating to put him to, uh, to, to, to about what is coming in to try to curb. Uh, so I don't know. Uh, I think that's something that only professionals can uh, comment. But I don't think it has anything to do with our management of Africa. We are not closing all the borders, and we are not saying this is going to go on uh, permanently, and it's not directed against uh, any particular country. So uh, I think that's a real, rather technical and specific uh, uh, 
uh, area. Actually, what a lot has I'm been made of the rice Google. smuggling yeah. and the economic reasoning behind it. The president has boasted that that border closure has yielded economic results. People like um, the Emir of Kano, Mohammed Sanusi II, have also supported this for economic reasons. But I wanted to ask you on a broader scale, since you're saying you're not you know, versed of all the facts on this issue, on, a, a, on the broader topic of protectionism in the era of the African Free Trade Continental Agreement. Your thoughts on that? Yeah, I was surprised when the president was kicking against protectionism at the UN address. Uh, protectionism is part of uh, statism, you know, a state, statist strategy of development. You must protect certain uh, actors, certain industries, certain layers. Otherwise, you cannot uh, compete. And if you cannot compete, then what's the point? Especially now that we are talking about uh, African Free Trade Union, there must be some level of protectionism. Whether that, uh, uh, whether that should assume the level of closure of uh, borders and so on, I don't know. But protectionism is, is, a, is a great value at a certain point. Why is the U.S. and China, why are they fighting? Of course, it's part of their big power tussle, but it's also part of so it's also about protectionism at work. Okay, um, I wanted to also just get a sense from you. One of the things you have said is, can this president lay down the foundation of his anti-corruption, especially with the three years that he has left? Can he demonstrate the anti-corruption um, flag that he has been flying from the beginning and actual? Um, results. I want to ask you, in light of that, what is what is your, what do you think that the president will do, or the, and the vice president who has actually um, waived his immunity when it comes to these allegations against the vice president around corruption or improperity? What what is your what is your take on what the president can demonstrate and what the vice president can demonstrate, especially in light of these allegations? I mean, the vice president alone saying he's waiving his uh, immunity, even if he does that, does not constitute any paradigm uh, shift in terms of uh, a regime fighting corruption. The vice president is just one individual, just an office in the presidency. The presidency itself is just a, a, a one component of the government itself. So the narrative about corruption will not come from what the vice president does individually or what even the president does although they have uh, definitive inputs. What we are talking about is a, a larger framework of how to go about it. Where is the problem coming from? Why is it peculiar to Nigeria or not peculiar to Nigeria? This is what Nigeria has decided to do. You know, and the way this relates to accepted norms in terms of fighting corruption, these are the, these are the issues. Otherwise, otherwise, it can be hijacked. Otherwise, the contradictions can, contradictions can emerge, and you may not, the government may not be able to manage the contradictions, and already the contradictions are there. The narratives have been taken away from them. But and that's I, why I, I was raising the question, can they, can they recover? I understand that you are saying that there's a holistic approach that needs to be taken, but is there an opportunity for there to be a demonstration of the beginning of this holistic approach? I feel that... This is now something that is out there. The vice president has already commented and chimed in, even though there is a lot of debate about the fact of if he can or cannot waive immunity. Do you think that this is an opportunity for this administration to step up and show and demonstrate that they are open and that there are no sacred cows? Yeah, the difficulty about uh, talking uh, about whether the, pre the government will do this or do that is the fractured nature of the regime itself. It is so fractionalized that it is impossible to imagine what would happen in response to any particular case. You have what you all call the cabal, you have the Buhari boys, you have the, the contenders from outside, and these are almost ne uh, nearly irreconcilable groups within the government. So the question is, which of the groups will take the primary seat and insist that this is the way to go and cleanse the regime 
of the image it has already got from certain actions it has taken. People are now saying, okay, you didn't punish so, so, so person, but you found it very easy to punish the chief justice, and now you have taken on the head of service, and they are all from one part of the country. So these sort of images are sedimenting. The truth or otherwise of it is immaterial. Once people believe that this is the direction you are going, that's the way they will act, and that's the way they will re respond to issues concerning you. So that image is such that I am wondering if any fraction within the government will be able to insist and put his foot down and get a narrative out and demonstrate that narrative in a way that doubting Thomases will say, okay, we are now with the government. I think that's the, that's the puzzle on the ground. Quite the conundrum. That's the puzzle on the ground. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So um, let's um, change oh, tack okay. a little bit there. Um, as the Bielsa and Kogi State elections approach in November, right now we're at the point where PVCs are being collected, non-sensitive materials are being delivered. What should INEC do differently from what we saw with the general elections earlier this year? Now, INEC at that point made their position on party primaries crystal clear, yet there's still disputes about party primaries in Bielsa, in PDP and APC. Their case has been filed in courts, and in Kogi State, there are already reports of violence. What do we expect INEC to do at this point? I don't expect INEC to do anything. I don't think they are going to do anything. I don't think they are thinking of uh, anything fundamental. I think the problem is the way the political nature of Nigeria. I, I saw something about... Uh, uh, Fashola saying something about the mindset of the Nigerian. I think that's where the problem fundamentally lies. It's, it's up to an elite that has t taken the people for granted to behave anyhow they like. But it is also another dimension of that, that you have a citizenry that thinks that certain people are gods. They cannot be challenged. And they have no capacity to mobilize on a grand scale, beyond ethnicity, beyond religion. And every year, you conduct an election, even local government election, even world election, some people will die. And still, Nigeria is not shocked. You collect money to, 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 to change the election result. You collect money to shoot people. You collect money to, 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 to dump ballot box where they should not be dumped. And these are done by citizens. And, and, and they keep complaining of bad government. And it doesn't strike them. You can't make one mistake 10, 20 times and still call it mistake. I, I don't understand where that, why that's possible. Why that's, is it uh, elite mobilization along their own lines? Is it just the nature of our people? I can't understand. So unless there is a move from that from below, then INEC as a bureaucratic institution it's just going to reflect the power relations that uh, inhere in the society. What can they do? If there is nobody there who wants to make a change, and even if there are, what room do they have? The higher agencies that is within the, the, the political power uh, setup, it does not lie with the bureaucracy. And who, who would want to be a hero? They will throw him out and bring another person. IBB did that. Emiawa wasn't the sort of person that uh, would take uh, everything. And he found uh, another scholar, another intellectual. So this is, uh, what is it called? The game of, uh, what is it? The game know. of thrones. Game of, game of thrones. <laughs> so Kogi and Bayesa, I don't think. Uh, uh, I wanted to ask you about CBN's um, peg on interest rates, but unfortunately, we've run out of time. Thank you so much, Mr. Dagbo Onoja, for joining us this morning. Thank you very much.